uh, today I'm going to go over chapter three, and as I've done at least a couple times in the past, I'm going to kind of bounce back and forth between the book here that I have up in CourseSmart and, and then going back in, and I've created a real simple project so far with nothing in it. All right, and I'm just going to go, like I said, jump back and forth between the two. If you are following along, I'm on page 119 of the book, and uh, as you can see here in our topics, we'll talk about the text box, which I've already mentioned to you, look at variables, which I've had you use in programs, but we haven't really looked at them in really any depth or breadth of coverage, talk about the numeric data types that are available inside of C Sharp, how to do some, some fairly simplistic calculations, the inputting and outputting of numeric values, in other words, some formatting we'll talk about, exception handling, and you've seen this stuff before because that's why I gave you those programs the other day, and we'll go back and take a look at them again too. Using name constants, I showed you that the other day. Declaring variables as fields, it, using the math class, and some more stuff with GUIs. So again, the hope is to get through this entire chapter today. It starts on 119, and uh, the actual chapter text goes to about 186. So I mean, it's about 65 to 70 pages, but there are a lot of pictures and a lot of code and stuff in there. And again, a lot of the material that we've had, we've, we, that's been in there, we've already talked about. All right. So the first thing that they mention here on the bottom of page 119 is they start talking about the text box. And you've seen this before, but if, I, if you look up on the screen here, if I come down to my toolbox and I find text box and I drag it in, you'll notice yeah, it, it comes in as, in as white. One thing about a toolbox, text box, sorry, one thing about a text box is technically it's a tool that you can use for either inputting or outputting information. All right. Most of the time, for, for labels, for example, you just use a label for output, okay? It holds a heading or it's going to hold something or whatever. But I can sit there and I can key stuff into this, but if I want to, I can also place stuff into this, all right? And you'll notice when, you, when I take a look in here, for example, uh, if I go and click on the lightning bolt to bring up the different events, all I want to mention to you is, again, there are a lot of different events. And I think I mentioned this to you before, but on the off chance, I didn't. When you go and you put controls on the screen, I'm just going to throw a couple up here just so you see these. All right, these are all things that if we haven't talked about them yet, we will talk about them. So you see I've got here, I've got a button and a label and a text box. And pretty soon we're going to get into talking like about combo boxes. And we'll get into list boxes, etc. So you'll see all these. But for any of these... For example, I've got a list box up here, and if you look, you'll notice if I work, keep working my way down, I've got one of those, what happens automatically in your properties window is one of the properties is automatically in blue, like you see, and that's the default property. The other way you can find out what the default property is, so for, for a button, you already know this, right, it's in here someplace, it's the click event. So the other way we find out is we double click on it, all right? Well, again, I, I, this is just a junky program, so I'm not going to go change the names and stuff, although I should, but just so you know, but if you look here on the text box, you'll notice that the, there it is, on the text box that the, well, let's just double click it. All right, it's called the text changed event. And the reason that I'm telling you that is, again, not to waste my time or yours, but if I run this program, and again, it's not going to do anything. I'm not going to program stuff up. But I, what I want you to realize is this. If I type in my first name, what literally what that did was that instituted seven different text changed events. Every time I'm, I'm hitting a keystroke, an event is being raised there. All right? That's why a lot of times, unless, you know, so why would I want to do that? Why would I care? Well, what I can do is in my text changed event, I can set that up. So for example, the only thing that that will accept in there are numbers. So if I tried to put my name in there like that, literally I could just type in J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, but nothing would show. It wouldn't take it. All right? So what you can do is some input validation like that. All right? So kind of keep that in mind as we start off. So again, they'll talk about the text box control. 
All right, it says whenever you retrieve the, the contents of a text property, you're always getting a string. So regardless of what you put in there. So even if, if for example, on that program I said, if I made this label that's right here. So if I took that label and I put text on that label that's, you know, that said uh, salary. All right, so there is the label for that. Well, the system could care less that that says salary. Whatever you put in here, even if I type in 50,000, that's literally the, the text string 50000. All right, it's not the number 50,000. So you've got to do some conversions in order to be able to use that mathematically. And you'll see that as we go on in the chapter here today. The property that you use most often, the property now, not the method, but the property you use most often with a text box is text. All right, and again, you can, you can put that on the left-hand side of an equal sign where you're setting the property. You can put that on the right-hand side of an equal sign, all right, where you're basically getting the property. But I think, again, hopefully this is stuff you all realize. So with this text box, okay, I've already called a text box one, so I might as well just call that button one. So if I come in here and say text box one, dot text equals hello world. All right, you've seen this kind of stuff before. All right, so this should make sense to all of you. What that's going to say now is when I click that button, it says hello world there. And it's the text property is the one literally that we're manipulating right there. Now, there might be other properties that you'd work with. And, and of course, there's a lot of aesthetic properties that you can work with on here. You can play with a font. You can play with a color. I don't care. What I'm telling you is the one that you're going to be most concerned with most of the time is going to be the text property. All right? And for an event, most often it'll be the text changed property. So they have you create a program in here where you enter your name, and then it tells you the name you entered. So I think that's kind of a stupid program, but there's nothing wrong with it. But what he's showing here is you've got a text box that you enter your name in. When you click the read input, it puts it in there in a label. Again, the difference is this is read-write, the text box, the label is read-only. Does that make sense to people? The other thing, in case you haven't known this, you haven't figured this out, in case I haven't shown this to you, we looked the other day, and we looked over here, we went over to View, and we went to Tab Order. If you weren't here the other day, this is one of the things we did. So if I set that to 0, and let's say that to 1, that to 2, and that to 3, and that to 4, all right? And then I run the program. I just want to show you what happens here. You notice where my mouse is at the start. It's right here. So when I tab and tab and tab and tab, did you notice something that happened there? You can't tab to a label. The label can't get the focus. All right? But sometimes what you want to do is you want to set up something that's inside of a text box so you, you want to be able to put something in a text box, but once it's in there, you don't want to allow the user to change it. We've already seen this. So you could come down here, and one of the properties that you have is read only. And it's set to false by default, meaning that you can read write. But if I go down and I click on it, and I can either double click it to set it to true, or I can click on it and choose the down arrow here and set it to true, it turns a grayish color. But notice if I run the program again, if I click this, it still says hello world, but now I can't, I can't change what's in there. All right, so by default, the text box is a read-write property, but by setting the read-only property to true, it's almost like a label. The difference, though, between having a text box with, with read-only set to true and having a label is you can't tab to a label. You can tab to this. Even if it's set to read-only, you can't change it, but you can still tap to it. All right. All right. I, by and large, I like the definitions that uh, that the author gives for for uh, different terminology. So, what this is his definition right here. He talks about a variable, and he says a variable. Let me. He 
this is a variable with storage location and memory that is represented by a name. That's all correct. I don't disagree. But I'd like to keep my, my definitions as crisp and as small as possible. So I say a variable is a named storage location. And I don't even, it is in memory, but whose contents may vary. That's why you get the name variable. They can vary. So the idea is that you set that, you set it, but you might change it. So for instance, if you ask somebody their salary right now and they said $30,000, if you ask them in five years from now, ideally, it's going to be more than $30,000. It will have changed during that time. Some things don't change. All right, my name hasn't changed throughout my life. All right, although my brother, when I was a kid, as a joke, told me that my name was spelled J-E-F-F-E-R-E-Y. And for the first 10 years of my life, I thought that's the way it was spelled. All right, until my mom saw me signing my name once, and she said, why'd you write it like that? You spelled your name wrong, which embarrassed me a little bit, but he loved it. All right, on the other hand, when you're not using something like this, so that, again, that's a variable. All right, on the other hand, when you have a constant, technically a constant is a variable, but it's a variable whose, const whose contents may not change. That's the difference between them. Once you've set a constant, you set it once, and it's set it and forget it type of an idea. All right? Now, some people, when they are creating variables, they, you know, and again, this, sometimes this is language dependent or whatever, but I want to show you this because sometimes people like to do things like this. All right? So it, what I'm going to show you in just a minute is we're going to go in and create a variable. For example, I'll come in and do something like this. Int age equals 21. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. But sometimes what people like to do when they create their variables is they use something like this. In other words, they put a prefix in front of the variable to show what the variable's type is. If that helps you, go ahead and do that. All right? And if it doesn't help you, then forget I said it. But again, sometimes people like to do things like this because it makes it easier for them to understand and remember that what the kind of variable that is, is it's an integer variable. And if you don't know what int is, we'll go through that before the class is over today. So again, he gives you his definition here, and there's nothing wrong with his definition. When you create a variable, you must give it a data type. We're going to talk about what those are in just a minute. You must also give the variable a name. So in this example that I just showed you right here, the variable type is int, and the name is either age or int age. Here's the rules. There's only three of them. Bottom of page 122. The first character in, in a variable must be a letter, uppercase or lowercase or an underscore. I'm going to recommend that you never start a variable name with an underscore. Usually that's reserved for system variables, stuff that's going on behind the scenes. All right. After the first character, you can use more alphabetic characters or digits or underscores. Usually you're best off, if you can, just using letters. All right, your code reads more English-like, and it's usually it's easier for people to understand. All right, and your name cannot contain spaces. So you usually, like I showed you the, with this example with int age, you usually run things together. So in other words, if I was going to make a variable called tax rate, you usually do it like that. The first character is lowercase, and then when you put words together, so if I would say tax rate for be a stupid variable name, but just so you get the idea. That's normally the way that you set it up. Now, there's no one that makes you do it like that. That's just by convention. That's what most people do. All right. String variables in here. This is unlike what those of you who were in the JavaScript class learned last year. When you've got a string variable like this, notice what they've done here. Use their, use their example that they showed right here. All right. So they've got um, string Product description, product description, and then a little bit later they say product description equals Italian espresso machine. All right. I think you already know this, but 
if I wanted to, I can do that. So in other words, when I declare a variable, this is the variable declaration. This is the variable initialization. You can declare and initialize on different lines, or you can declare and initialize on the same line. Okay? And you might say, well, that's fine. Why would you ever want to do that? Why would you ever want to put it in two lines like this? Well, maybe in between here, you know, you were figuring out what the name of that product was going to be or the description or whatever. So there might be some more code in there. So sometimes you declare a variable and you don't give it a value. Now, right there, that has no value in it. All right. And you'll typically, in most programming languages, if you try to print this out before you've given it a value, you'll get an error message because there's nothing set up in there. So a lot of times, if you're not sure what it is yet, you just initialize it to this. And that's called the empty string. We looked at that a little bit in the program the other day. If you want to concatenate things, this is a real simple example, basic example, not a bad example. And when I'm about to say, some of you heard this, I think, in the Java class the other day. This example that you see right here, string message. Okay, again, we don't have to put this on two lines, although it's fine that we did. Okay, message equals hello with a space plus world. There, the plus sign is not being used for addition. It's being used for concatenation. So the plus sign there is what's called an overloaded operator. Okay? And the system knows that if you, if you use it like this, all right, to, to make it be string concatena concatenation. But if I come in and say int x equals 7, int y equals 10, int z equals x plus y, there the system knows that's addition. There it knows it's concatenation. So based on the context in which you're using it, the system knows how to use it. It does, it, it literally, you might say, well, that is an addition. It's like an addition. But technically, you're adding two non-numeric values together. So it's not called addition. It's called concatenation. And if you didn't put that space in there, right, that they show right there, if you didn't put that in, so if we left it out, it would look like, Hello, world. It would run together. Okay. So they've got, you know, this is an, another one where they ask you to put in your first name, to put in your last name, and then they run them together and show you what your entire name looks like. So Chris Jones gives you Chris Jones. Okay. All right. Now they talk here about local variables, and you may or may not realize this, but you've already seen what they're talking about here. So they've got a button. And in the buttons click event, they're creating a variable called my name, and then they're setting it equal to something, which is all fine. All right? But let's go back to the program here. So in other words, if I come into my button routine right here, and I've got that text box dot text, you've already seen that. But if I come in here and I declare a variable, so I'm going to say right here, int age equals 21. Okay? And after I've got that text box, I get the underlines here because I haven't used it yet. So I'm just going to say message box dot show. And I'm just going to keep it real simple. I'll just say age is plus age dot two string. It probably would work without the two string, but I'm going to put it in there. All right. So this is what I want to show you. So I'm, I'm going to just save this and run it. And notice when I run it and click the button, what happens? Age is 21. It should make sense to people. That's not the important thing. What I want to show you, though, is notice if I come up here and I try to change, for example, in the text changed, I'm going to say age equal 13. All right, notice I get that underline here and I get the squiggly. Age is not known there. I declared age right here. So it's only known from, the play, from where it's defined until it reaches that ending curly brace. If I want to be able to use age here or here, then I have to declare it right up at the top of my program. So if I come up here and say int age like that, then notice how it went away right there. And you say, well, it did, look, you got another age. That's, yes, that's what that is. That's another age. So that age that you see here is the same one I'm using here. But this one is different. So I can declare a variable outside of any one of my 
what are called methods here, and then it's global to the program. I can use it anywhere. Or I can declare variables inside of a method like this, and it's only known here. So notice, all right, if I come up here and I've got, you know, this text H, what I'm going to do otherwise, because it, it would just be stupid to do it this way, but I'm just going to, I'm literally going to throw another button out here. So I'm going to throw another button out here, and I'm going to use the same code that I had before. All right? And just to finish this up to prove a point. So when I click button 1, it says age is 21. That's that local variable called age. When I click button 2, it says age is 13. That's that global variable that was defined outside of any of those here. All right? And sometimes the only way this is going to make sense to you is to sit and create a simple program and play with it. You'll learn a lot more from that than you will from me showing you some simplistic examples like this. All right, so I was showing you the scope of the variable, and I also showed you the lifetime, and I showed you that you could duplicate variables. All right. Now, assignment compatibility. So notice string product description equals truffle. All right, so we already looked at that in here where we did this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pretend we did it all on one line. So what we're doing right here is we're letting the system know that the only thing product description can hold is some kind of string, something within double quotes. So if later on in my program, I'm just going to put a couple dots there, meaning later on in the program, if I come in and do this, does it make sense to people? I'm going to get an error message here because I didn't put that 27 within double quotes. I'm trying to take a number and assign it to a string variable. You can't do that. In much the same way, I can't turn around and say int y equals 10. That's not going to work either. All right, I'm mixing variable types or variable declarations with what I'm trying to initialize the variables with. And that's the compatibility thing that they talk about in here. A variable only holds a value at a time. So in other words, when I came up here and I say string product description equals Italian ex espresso machine, then later on I say equals okay. Now product description does not hold this anymore. And since it's a string, strings are what are referred to as being immutable. In other words, when I when I create this, someplace in memory, I don't know where, I don't care. But imagine memories that is like tons of different mailboxes. But someplace in one of those mailboxes is, you know, or actually a bunch of them that are together, they're going to put this. And then when I change it, someplace else in memory, it's going to put this. What that means is now I've got a place in memory that's still holding this that's garbage because no, nothing's using it anymore. So what happens is C Sharp has something that's called the garbage collector that runs every once in a while and it says, hey, nothing is referencing this. So it'll get rid of it for you. You don't have to worry about it. All right. Otherwise, you would just have, you know, it's kind of like when your disk fragments, you know, because you've got junk that you've saved all over the place. Okay. Again, he does go through here and explains this line by line. I just don't want to sit and read to you. All right. So here they ask you to enter the day of the week, the name of the month, the n number date of the month, and the year. And when you put all that good stuff in, so if I put Friday, June 1st, 1990, it just concatenates it together. Again, there's nothing wrong with the program. If that helps you to learn, then by all means, take a look at that. All right, I've talked a little bit about initializing variables. And as it says, if you just do this, if you say string product description, and then you try to do a message box or something like that on it right away, you're going to get an error message. And as it says right here, it says it'll say something along the lines of use of unassigned local variable because you've created the variable, but you didn't give it a value. All right. All right. They do mention that you can do stuff like this in this language. You can do this, or you can do this. Your instructor doesn't like that, though. So, for example, with this one right here, I don't want you to do it like that. 
even though it's a little bit more work on your part, I would rather have you do it like this. String last name equals Jones. String first name equals Jill. String middle name equals Rebecca. I want you to do it like that. To me, that makes more sense. Take a look at it that way. Again, depending on how anal you are, you can line stuff up. You don't have to lie. I don't care. But I'd rather have you set them up that way so each variable should be on its own line. So that's what I'll expect you to do. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the numeric data types. And in fact, I'm going to turn on the next page here, and they talk about some of the ones that are in here. Now, they talk in here about an integer. An integer is a whole number. Notice that the range of an integer in C sharp is negative 2 billion plus through positive 2 billion plus. So unless you're doing something with a national debt or something like that, probably that would hold, you know, a regular int would be big enough. But there are offshoots and variants of an integer. There is a long integer. There is a short integer. Um, there is a type called byte. There, there's a few other things. But for, for all intents and purposes, everything we do in here, int will be fine. But again, the thing with int means it's got to be a whole number. So in other words, and, and I hopefully again this just makes sense, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can say if I want to, that's okay. The one in blue. The one underneath it is not okay. With the one that's underneath it, if I want to do that, then I have to make it of type double, meaning that it can hold a decimal place. And that's what they're showing here. Double has uh, a, an offshoot that's called float. Let's not even worry about it for right now. If you just stick with it and double, you're fine. The other type that's in here is decimal, and typically when people use decimal, it's that you're using it for monetary types of things. And if you use double, what will happen is if you write an amortiz amortization program or something like that, and you do it over years, you might be off by a number of cents. All right? Maybe you've seen that kind of thing. I've told the story before because it's the truth. Years ago, I paid my car off, and before the bank sent me the title, they sent me uh, a, a, a nasty gram and, and with a letter with saying that I owed seven cents and because it, it, when it was on there, it was on them. All right. The funny thing was that the stamp on there was more than the seven cents that I owed them. All right. And if you knew me and you know what kind of a wise ass I am, I sent them a check. All right. So that was fine. That was what they wanted. I did. I did what they asked. You know. And I got the title a few weeks later. A numeric literal here on the bottom of 134, the literal there is 40. Literals can never appear on the left-hand side of an equal sign. So I can't say int 40 equals hours work. That doesn't make sense. All right. But variables can appear either on the left-hand side of an equal sign or on the right-hand side of an equal sign. All right. Constants can only, you know, a constant that we talked about before, can only appear on the left-hand side of an equal sign when it's being initialized. After that, it must always appear on the right-hand side of an, of an equal sign. All right, and again, I showed you some of this stuff in here already. You know, you can't use int and, and mix these up. All right. All right. It says here you can explicitly convert values with cast operators. And again, some of you may have seen me in this class, in, in another class, give this example, but I want to make sure you understand this. And so I'm just going to quickly write this down. Int x equals 17. And x and y and z are crummy names, but int y equals 3. Int z equals x divided by y. Oh, not s. x divided by y. What that's going to do is it'll take 17, divide it by 3, and it'll give you 5. And it'll figure out the remainder. So it knows that it's 5.666, etc. But since it's an integer divided by an integer, it throws the remainder away. Okay? It doesn't round it up. It just throws it away. So the answer to that is 5. Even if I do this, 
it's still, the answer to that is still 5, 5.0 5 now, but it's 5. So if I want to do that and I want to make sure that this works, there's three ways that I can make sure it works. So I'm just going to throw all of them in here. All right. I, d I can do what's called casting. So I can say double and I can cast X or I can cast, cast Y or if I really want to, I can cast both X and Y. In all three of those cases that you see right there, all of these that are in blue, the answer it'll give me is 5.66666 or something like that. All right? Okay. And they talk about casting, and they show you an example or some examples here on page 137. All right. Calculations. Here's your math operators on page 138. Most of you, I, I realize not all of you, but most of you have gone through the um, <clears throat> JavaScript class. So you've already been introduced to these operators. Plus for addition, minus for subtraction, asterisk for multiplication, forward slash, not a backward slash for division, and a percent sign for modulo. Modulo was a remainder, so with the example that I gave you before, <clears throat> If I say equals x modulo y, that says take 17, divide it by 3, which is 5, and give me the remainder, which is 2. So that's the remainder operator. Usually when you use the modulo operator, you're doing what, working with dollars and cents or hours and minutes and seconds or something that you want to be able to break down from a bigger value to, a, to smaller value. Now, when you work with this also, and again, this is something hopefully you learned back in your high school algebra days. If I write myself a, uh, an expression that looks like this, and again, I'm not, not going to declare new variables. I'm just going to say this. x plus y, y divided by z times j minus 8. All right? Well, what's going to happen is it look, the, the system looks through this, and it doesn't do this first. All right, it says I have to do division and multiplication before I do addition and subtraction. So what it does here is it does that first, right there. It takes the result of that and it multiplies the result by this. Then it goes back and it takes that result and it adds x to it. Then it takes that whole result and subtracts 8. If I want to change that around, if I want the x plus y to be done first, I must do it like that. And if I want to make sure that happens, I can always, even if it means over parenthesizing, I can do this. All right. Now it'll do, it always works in the innermost parentheses and it works its way out. So it'll do this first, then it'll take the results of this and divide it by z, then it'll do the multiplication, then it'll take the results of that and do the subtraction. So bottom line is when in doubt, parenthesize. Okay. I mean, I've seen people do this, and I don't know why, but, you know, y equals x plus z, for example. And I've, literally, I've seen people do this. I have no idea why someone would do that, but you can. The system doesn't care. It'll probably take a little longer to process, and it doesn't really give you anything, but you can do that. So, again, the nor normal order of operations when you've got all these is you'll end up doing um, multiplication and division and modulo before you end up doing addition and subtraction. And if you keep that in mind, when you're in doubt, again, parenthesize. And that's what they get to in here. They give you the order of operations. You know, anything in parens first, then multiplication, division, modulo, then addition and subtraction. Again, you can parenthesize as much as you want to or need to parenthesize. All right? You can do what's called mixed math. Okay, so in other words, I can do what I'm about to show you right here. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. So I can come in here and say int x equals 5. Double y equals 17. Double z equals x divided by y. 
you may or may not be aware of this, but literally what happens here, because this is mixed math, I'm attempting to divide a double by an int. So you'd think what would, what would be happening there is it would say uh, 17 divided by 5. In reality, what it does is it says 17.0, and it makes a copy of this, and it promotes it so it makes that also a double. You don't see that, and it's all copies because it's on the right-hand side of an equal sign. But that's internally, that's what's happening in the machine because it wants to work with apples and apples as opposed to apples and oranges type of an idea. So they give you a bunch of examples there on 141, 142, all right? And then starting on page 142, they, they, they give you some other stuff here. All right, so if I come through here and I say int x equals 10, and again, when I put these three dots oops, here, I just mean I've got some code. So something happened in here. If I want to say x equals x plus 10 more here, I can write that in, and that's fine. But there's a shortcut for writing it like this. So these two statements here do exactly the same thing. In fact, most of them have counterparts. So if I want to say x equals x minus 10, I can say x minus equals 10. If I want to say x equals x times 10, I can say x times equal 10. Oops. I can do the same thing with divide. And finally, I can do the same thing with modulo. So every one of those that you see, followed by its counterpart, these all do the same thing. And that's pretty much what they show you in the table, table 3-7 that's on the bottom of page 142. Okay? And even though they don't talk about it now, I'm going to mention it here anyway, that in computers, quite often, especially if you're in a loop or something, and we're going to get into that in a later chapter, you want to add one to a variable. So if I come in here and I've got um, int x equals 16, and then later on in my program, I want to add one to x. You already know now I can say either x equals x plus 1, or I can use the shortcut x plus equal 1. Either one of those will work. There's also two other ways. But what I'm about to show you now only works if you want to add 1 to it. Not any other number, but just 1. If I want to add 1, I can also say x plus plus, or I can say plus plus x. That's called the auto increment operator. What's the difference between putting it at the beginning and putting it at the end? I'll wait until the book gets into it. All right. And just like there's an auto increment, There's also an auto decrement. So I can say x equals x minus 1, x minus equal 1, x minus minus, or minus minus x. But again, all of these only work if I want to either add or subtract 1. So I've seen people try this before. Hey, Jeff, I'm having a problem with my code. And I look, and they've done x plus plus 10. It doesn't work. No, because it doesn't work. That won't work. That will work. All right, so if you keep that in mind, you'll be a lot better off. All right, moving up to page 143. They start to talk a little bit in here about um, formatting stuff that's in text boxes. First of all, getting a number from a text box, okay? And they're going to show you some routines, and again, one of the reasons that it's recommended before you take this class that you take the 152, 119, in other words, the JavaScript classes, those of you, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I know, by and large, for, for most of you, who has and who has not taken the JavaScript class. And it's not that, that oh my God, you didn't, I didn't take that class, I'm going to fail now. No. But you've already seen parse methods. We've already looked at parse methods in those classes, is what I'm saying. And so if we look at the example that they have here. All right. 
think this is the one they have here in the book. So imagine that what I have right here is I've got a text box, okay, and that text box is called hours worked. So again, imagine that we've got this and that thing that instead of, we, instead of salary like we had in there, that's now we're going to say that what that should be called is hours worked. So if that's what we want to put in there is hours worked and we won't make it read only anymore, okay? So that's what we want to do in this example that they're showing in the book right here. What this literally says <clears throat> is grab the value. Remember, you do parentheses first. So grab the value that we put into that text box and attempt to parse it or convert it into an integer. And after you've converted it into an integer, then throw it into the variable called hours worked. Now, there's nothing wrong with the author's example, but what I would say is typically when you say to somebody, how long did you work? For instance, my daughter works at, at McDonald's. And with her, sometimes they let her go, you know, if they're just not busy. And they don't wait till the hour's up or the half hour. They'll sometimes just say, hey, Chloe, just leave. So usually, rather than seeing that as an int, you'll see it as a double. All right, and this will be double dot parse. And the reason that I'm telling you that is if you leave it as an int like they had it and I put in here 36.5, it's going to fail. All right. And it's like, well, wait a minute, that didn't fail in JavaScript. You could still do that. It would just throw away everything after the decimal point. Here, this is a, high, a strongly typed language. So when you put that in, as soon as it sees something illegal, boom, it just pukes out. It doesn't want to go So again, that's the example that they're showing here. He does a good job of explaining all this stuff. So when you put that in, as, as it's shown there on page 145, that is not the number 40. That is the character string 40 that technically has no mathematical value associated with it. It's only after you parse it, okay, that it becomes a mathematical value. And you can parse int, you can parse double, you can parse decimal. Again, he shows you plenty of examples. So it says here on the bottom of page 145, suppose you entered X, Y, Z into the text box, and then you did this. What will happen if you do that is literally it will do what's called throwing an exception. And I'd like to show you that right now because you're all going to see it sooner or later. Everybody is. All right. So what I want to do in here. And we'll use button two. I don't think that, yeah, we'll get, get rid of that code that's in there. All right. So what I want to do is I want to grab what's in there, and I want to parse it or turn it into an integer, okay? And then I'll display it in a message box. Okay, so that's what I want to do. So I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to say uh, int, we'll make it an integer too, int x equals Parse. Did I do it backwards? No, it, it's oh, it integer dot parse. It is int dot parse. Okay. Equals int dot parse. Text box one dot text. Make sense what I'm trying to do, and probably this would have worked, but let's see. All right. Now, so what I'm attempting to do here, so then I'll say message box dot show the value entered was x dot two string. And and if you don't know what all this stuff means for right now, don't worry about it. All right. I want I'm going to make this work and then I'm going to purposely blow it up. All right? Because I want to show you an exception because everybody gets them. 
So I click in here. And I think I didn't, I didn't set a value in here, so good. I'm going to get an exception. There it is. It's telling me, hey, I attempted to do that conversion, and you didn't put anything in there. So you get all this stuff up. And one thing you can do is, well, heck with it. Okay. But there's a lot of good information. We talk about this in a later chapter when we start to talk about how to debug. All right. This is called your locals window, and this is your call stack window right here. So if that happens, what do you do? Well, you click the red button here, which says stop the run. All right. Now when I run it again, notice if I come in here now and put in 34 and click the button, it says the value entered was 34 because I did something valid. The first time I did it, what I did was invalid. All right. Again, unlike JavaScript, for those of you who were in the class last semester, unlike JavaScript, this is C Sharp is what's called a highly typed or strongly typed language. You have to let the system know exactly what the type of variable is that you you know that the value you're going to put into the variable, and you can't change it after you've created it. All right. So again, you already saw that. I can't say string my name equals 346. That's illegal. I can't say int salary equals none of your business. I can't do things like that. All right, so you already saw these exceptions a little bit. And this is, if you, this is stuff worth reading. So if you look on your book on page 146, under this displaying numeric values about halfway down on the page, you may or may not have noticed I did it. But when you look at my code here, I use that to string. So what I said was, grab the value that is a string and throw it in into an integer. But when I want to print it out in the message box, convert it back into a string again. So you do that a lot as a programmer where you convert things from one thing to another. Since they're on the right-hand side of an equal sign here, and it's not on the right-hand side of equal sign, all I'm doing is making copies. So I am able to do that. I'm not changing the value right here of X. Okay. There, they talk about this implicit string conversion with a plus operator. It's a little confusing. There are things that you can do to make your life easier. All right. I'm going to go over this quickly, then we're taking a break. If you look on pages 148, 149, and 150, the author gives a very simple program here that does miles per gallon. Okay. So you put a miles driven in there, you put a gallons used in there, you click the calculate button, and boom, it gives you your miles per gallon. Okay, not much to it. Not really a lot of code to it either, because the magic that in the code here that does it is right here. But as of right now, with this program that you see on the screen right here, if I come through there and I put, you know, I leave the miles blank and or I leave the gallons blank, the program blows up. I'm going to get an exception. So what I have done, and I did this, and I mentioned this to you the other day, it's already there in your P drive if you want to see it. You don't have to bring it up or anything, but just so you know it's there, is on the P drive for this class, under the in-class folder for uh, the other day, I did four different versions of a miles per gallon program, which it collectively got better as far as what it handled. This one, if I run this right now, This first example, I, I believe there's no error checking in this one at all. So if I come in here and leave it blank and click calculate, the program's going to blow up. There's the, what you saw in the book. All right. I can basically I can get the details and it'll tell me what I did that it didn't like. All right. Normally you just want to quit from there. So that was the first one. Then with the second one, what I did was I put some 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 checks in there. So there was a minimum and a ma maximum miles per gallon. So if I put in this, you know, and it comes back and it says, well, it still doesn't like it. Out of range input. So I put that in there. All right. And if with the third one, more of the same, but let me just get to the fourth one that's here, because this is what we're going to be building towards after the break. This is very similar to what we did in class the other day. Now with this one, if I leave it blank, non-numeric input, boom. It doesn't let you go on. So if I put in this garbage, again, non-numeric input, and it removes it for me and it puts my cursor there. If I make it too big, 
Out of range input. Always nice to let the user know what they've done wrong. All right, so if I come back in here now and I'll put in 1,000. Now I get it, but notice here, it's, it's for there, for gallons used. All right, and it, hopefully, eventually, I'll put something in there that makes sense. Boom, and you see, too, that is a read-only field. So I put those four in for you. All right, it's a little more extensive than the program on 148, 149, and 150. So it's 851. Let's take a break. We'll come back a couple minutes after 9, pick it up on page 151, talking about formatting numbers with the two-string method.